Welcome to the Aspen video series on medications via enteral feeding tubes. This video series is a collaboration between Aspen and the University of Rochester Medical Center in Rochester, New York. We have developed a five-part video series on medications via enteral feeding tubes. Video one is introduction and organizational system considerations. Video two, prescribing medications, video three, medication order review, preparation, and dispensing, video four, preparing and administering medications for feeding tube delivery, and video five covers special considerations with medication administration, low-dose tip syringes, and fit cleaning techniques, and preparing for home. This video series was developed with an interdisciplinary approach by the Aspen workgroup members listed on this slide. Video one is the introduction and organizational system considerations for medication delivery via feeding tubes. I am Linda Lord, and I am here today with my colleague, Dr. Peggy Gunther. Upon completion of this video, participants will be able to, one, describe the complex nature of medication delivery via feeding tubes, two, explain how improper medication delivery through feeding tubes can lead to reduced drug effectiveness, increased drug toxicity, tube clogging, and untoward GI symptoms, three, illustrate how an organizational systems thinking approach that includes all stakeholders is key to providing safe and high quality care across the continuum for medication delivery via feeding tubes, and four, identify resources available to determine medications that can be administered through the gastric and or small bowel routes, including proper preparation and administration. Individuals who are hospitalized in long-term care or in a home setting who are unable to swallow food or fluids to meet their needs may also be unable to safely take their medications orally. These individuals may have a feeding tube for administration of enteral nutrition and hydration. If the feeding tube is also required for medication administration, this adds an additional layer of complexity to assure patient safety and maintain tube patency. Fulfilling these objectives requires an interdisciplinary process of medication prescribing, preparation, dispensing, and administration. Not all oral medications are approved or have been evaluated for administration via the feeding tube route. To administer a medication through a feeding tube, it needs to be in liquid form, either by a manufacturer, the pharmacy, or the nurse or caregiver. By appreciating the complexity of drug administration through a feeding tube and using proper administration techniques, clinicians can ensure that therapeutic effective medications reduce drug toxicities and decrease the risk for tube clogging. Safe and proper medication administration through a feeding tube requires organizational resources and a systems thinking framework that promotes improvement in practice at the front line where patients, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, and dietitians interface. Although clinician resources on medication administration through feeding tubes are available, few encompass the whole drug use process from organizational considerations, including the various clinician roles to post-administration monitoring. This educational series will provide knowledge on the entire drug use process to promote safe and effective administration of medications through a feeding tube by addressing organizational considerations, the prescriber, the pharmacist, the nurse or caregiver, and the patient and patient monitoring. Improper medication administration via feeding tubes can decrease drug effectiveness, cause toxicity, clog the tube, and result in adverse GI symptoms, potentially harming the patient. Various factors contribute to these issues, including limited access to information, gaps in training and experience, incorrect route or tube size, 
improper preparation, and incorrect administration techniques. Tube clogging is a frequent complication that can occur in all types of feeding tubes, with incidents reported to be as high as 23 to 35%. Clogs produced by undissolved or viscous medications, drug-to-drug -drug interactions, drug-to-nutrient interactions, or improper flushing block the delivery of vital enteronutrition, hydration, and medications for these individuals. When tubes become clogged, they often must be replaced. Despite ongoing education, surveys suggest that 25 to 27 percent of clinicians do not flush tubes before or between medication administration, 25 to 49% mix medications together, 36 to 48% do not dilute liquid medications, and 10 to 15% crush modified release dosage forms. Safe delivery of medications to individuals who have feeding tubes requires correct preparation and administration techniques that ensure adequate bioavailability of medications without causing complication or patient harm. The consequences of incorrectly prepared and administered medications through a feeding tube, along with not holding tube feeding delivery for a specified time around some medications, can lead to decreased drug efficacy and or increased risk of drug toxicity. Therapeutic failures drug toxicities, and even fatalities have been reported. Slowed gastric emptying, cramping, abdominal distension, and diarrhea can occur with administration of liquid medications that have not been adequately diluted. Sweeteners such as sorbitol are added to many liquid medications to improve palatability for oral use, but also increase the osmolality of the solution. This is especially a concern for feeding tube tips located in the small bowel where higher osmolality liquid medications are more likely to lead to cramping, abdominal distension, and diarrhea. Besides the list of references at the end of this video, other resources and databases should be kept in mind. These are institutional drug resources, individual drug monographs, online sites and resources, and select books and articles. A systems thinking approach that considers the whole picture is essential for providing safe and high quality care across the continuum. The approach includes collaboration with all stakeholders involved in any of the steps of medication preparation, delivery, and administration to individuals with feeding tubes. Prescribers, nurses, dietitians, and pharmacists should work to develop and maintain evidence-based policies and procedures. Be clear about the responsibilities and tasks of prescribers, pharmacists, nurses, and dietitians. All healthcare personnel play a vital role in making sure that the prescribed drug is the correct dosage form, taken via the proper route, and prepared and delivered properly. This illustration shows the main institutional departments needed for the medication use process for meds through feeding tubes. The main hospital governing body oversees a variety of not often thought of departments, such as IT, legal and quality improvement, and purchasing. The main departments that are involved with medications include medical practice, pharmacy, and nursing. This would be similar in long-term care and home care. Those departments and functions not always thought of include informatics, where EHR builds to accommodate medication ordering, review, administration, and monitoring. Purchasing and supply chain, who purchase tubing, syringes, medication preparation devices, and do value analysis for purchasing. Medication purchasing, such as group purchasing organizations, and purchasing various drug dosage forms to accommodate the use of medication through feeding tubes. And of course, legal and quality improvement that look at adverse event and medication error reporting. 
Each of the main departments involved with medication administration through feeding tubes include nursing, medicine, and pharmacy. Each has layers of administration, legal safety, quality improvement, and a need for policies and procedures for their work in this area. Here you can see the supervision and policy and procedures needed by each department. Each of the main departments involved with medication administration also have legal and safety and quality improvement functions that overlap and work with each other within these three departments. Each of the main departments also have specific clinical actions and required roles in monitoring patients post medication administration. Each of these departments involved also have functions with informatics and documentation in the electronic health records. These main departments also have specific education and training regarding medication delivery. For the purposes of this video series, here are a set of definitions for use throughout the program. These include terms such as disperse, dissolve, dilute, and drug preparation. Preparation refers to any step that will be required of the pharmacy, the nurse or caregiver at home to alter the drug's commercial dosage form prior to administration. This alteration could be as simple as diluting a medication in water or as complex as compounding an extemporaneous formulation. Here are some additional NFIT related terms, such as NFIT connectors and NFIT low dose syringes. Some other NFIT related products include NFIT medication caps, NFIT standard syringes, and of course the old or legacy connectors. And finally, the definition of purified water which is an important term and the distinction that has to do with medication administration. For those not familiar with enteral access, there are short-term and long-term feeding tubes. In terms of short-term, there are nasogastric or orogastric for gastric feeding, and there are nasoenteric tubes for small bowel feeding. These are also called nasoduodenal or nasojejunal tubes. They are typically used for up to six weeks and range from 3.5 to 16 French sizes. They can be inserted at the bedside using blind insertion or aided with various direct or indirect instruments to improve safe passage. Other techniques use endoscopy or fluoroscopy. In terms of long-term enteral access, gastrostomy or G-tubes for gastric feeding, or they can be used for decompression or drainage. They can be standard long length tubes or low profile skin level devices. They range from 12 to 30 French sizes and can be inserted via endoscopy, surgically, or via interventional radiology. They can have an internal retention device and that can be filled with water or a non-balloon plastic dome. There are gastrojejunostomy tubes or GJ tubes that can be used for various reasons. They can be standard long length tubes or low profile skin level devices. They contain two lumens, one for the stomach and one to the jejunum. The gastric port the G port is typically used for drainage or decompression and the jejunal or J port for feeding to lower aspiration risk. They range in sizes from 6 to 30 French and can be inserted via endoscopy, surgically, or interventional radiology. Medications should ideally be given via the G port when possible if the G port is used for drainage, it must be clamped afterward for a period of time to facilitate medication passage into the small bowel.
Another type of long-term enteral access is the jejunostomy tube, or J-tube, for small bowel feeding. This can be standard long length tube or again, a low profile skin level device. They range from 12 to 24 French sizes and can be inserted via endoscopy, surgically or interventional radiology. Due to the small diameter and risk of clogging the tube, liquid medications are highly preferred for administration. If the liquid medication is high in osmolality, it may need to be diluted to prevent cramping and hyperosmolar diarrhea. Here are the references for this video. This video series was provided to you by Aspen in collaboration with the University of Rochester Medical Center and supported by Cardinal Health. <music>